So Help Wanted 2 has finally dropped and I would say it's my second favorite game behind Help Wanted itself. It was a nice refresher on old games that we haven't seen in a while, brought to new life in VR with new models, new animations, and more. And as usual, with that comes a little bit of lore. Now I'll leave all the surface level stuff to the big guys such as Raitos, Hyperdroid, ID, etc. I prefer to look deeper and there was one single line of dialogue in Help Wanted 2 that caused me to make this theory in the first place. Before we begin though, let me first share a little mini theory that I had a few weeks ago after rereading Tales for the 10th time. I'm inclined to believe that Eleanor, aka the Shadow or whatever you want to call her, is basically the equivalent of Shadow, mm, not Shadow Freddy, Freddy Krueger. So let me explain. If the events of the Stingers have indeed happened, then we all know Eleanor is dead. But if that is the case, how is she still around in Frailty and or Lally's game, arguably? Going back to how she was defeated, Jake and the Stitch Wraith ended up trapping her in a nightmare with the help of Larson. Now, for those who don't know or have not seen my other theory, Frailty is about a girl named Jessica who, at some point, finds a heart-shaped pendant and discovers that it has healing properties. She decides to use this supernatural force to help the less fortunate, and Jessica is able to get a job as a janitor at her local hospital so that she can use the pendant to heal sick children when no one is around. The pendant in the story is the same one from Fazbear Frights, and at the end, Jessica turns into a pile of metal scraps, exactly like Eleanor's previous victims. Going back to Frights, we previously stated that Eleanor was trapped in a nightmare as her demise was unable to return to the physical world. Now, where is the only place that Jessica encounters Eleanor? In her dreams. She chases her and rips her limbs off, well, no, I guess, yeah, she does rip her limbs off before taking the pendant. And when Jessica reawakens, the pendant is gone. Now, most of you right now are probably thinking that this is impossible because dreams can't affect the real world, right? That would be the case if the film didn't exist. In the film, if you haven't seen it, when Mike is having dreams of the MCI and Fritz scratches his arm, the cut is still there after he wakes up, so Scott has established that there are times when dreams affect the real world in FNAF. You could argue this for FNAF World and FNAF 3, but that's a different story, and it somewhat has to do with the main theory, although, but not really. All of this made me come to the conclusion that now she is haunting the nightmares or dreams of new victims since she isn't in the physical world, giving and taking the pendant as she pleases. That way we have a villain in the real world and the dream world. Nobody is safe. Now, with that out of the way, I'm going to tell you what I think is a big part of what people are missing regarding the main villain of this franchise. I present to you the hidden truth behind William Afton. We'll begin our story in FNAF 4. The story for that game gave us some info about William in mostly cryptic ways. He was a father of three children, Michael, Garrett, and Elizabeth. Up until recently, the consensus was that the story of FNAF 4 was about Michael Afton having nightmares about his brother being experimented on with illusion discs or whatever by William, and that is still correct to this day, but Scott decided to add some context, so to speak. Garrett, the crying child or the bite victim, was indeed experimented on and most likely Michael as well, but we weren't exactly sure how until recently. Rory is a seven-year-old boy who wakes up in the middle of the night to find that his doors, which he locked and closed beforehand, are now unlocked and opened. Unbeknownst to Rory, he has been repeating the same night and day over and over again, and that his parents don't exist. This is all because our good friend William Afton was pumping hallucinogenic gas into his room through air vents, causing him to hallucinate and experience what we know as the FNAF 4 gameplay, 
Although the gameplay itself is still Michael, this is just the method. Throughout the story, Rory occasionally talks on a walkie-talkie to his friend Wade. We learn later on that Wade isn't a real person, and that his existence is a ploy by William to keep Rory in the experiment rooms and unaware of what is going on around him. Wade suggests returning to the fake house since it has power, meaning it has a functioning generator. He expresses his fr frustration over the old radios being untraceable, telling Rory that cell phones can be traced in the present. Wade then says that the police gave up searching for Rory after a year, but his parents still tried to find him using private detectives and a website. Naturally, Rory starts to get curious and begins exploring the now disgusting looking house due to the gas pumps and the generator malfunctioning, and what he discovers is a generator connected to gas pumps in the wall. Rory begins to pull it out when a low and smooth voice from a middle-aged man comes from a speaker. The voice ignores Rory's questions and instead reminds Rory of all the things he hated about his past. Rory seemingly remembers running away due to how unhappy he was at school with girls and with his own parents. The man tells Rory this is his home now, where he is safe and secure. Quite possibly the most disturbing story in all of FNAF. And with that being the last story in Tales, it was then clear to me what Scott was trying to show us this entire time. The story up until now has all been a lie. Afton's biggest weapon, the weapon that he's had since the beginning, and one that he's been using for the entire length of this franchise. <laughs> It may not be obvious at first, even to some people who have been following the lore as much as other theorists, but Afton's manipulation runs pretty much throughout all of FNAF. Don't believe me? That's fine. Just sit back and listen. Back to Didophobia, we see during Rory's conversation with Wade that Wade is speaking a little out of character. He tells Rory that people were searching for him, including his parents, but that they stopped. As a reader, we know this isn't remotely true, but to Rory, it's the only truth he has. And that brings me to my next point. The reason William was able to gaslight Rory into continuing the experiments is because Rory hadn't known of any other life. He was experimented on since he was seven, so his entire childhood was basically stripped away from him. Anyways, after reading Didophobia, I noticed the occurrence of these words again. A safe slash special place. You're safe here. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Well, hold on to those words because they will become very important throughout this theory. Garrett, being the first experiment victim, was William's first and freshest opportunity for him to test out what he had been working on. So it makes sense that William got carried away. He used the Fredbear plush to manipulate Garrett, as evidenced by the dialogue from Plush Bear and further push him apart from Michael in order to make sure that his plan came to fruition. This also proves that William could have stopped the bite if he wanted to, but he just didn't. Not only that, but if you believe the therapist tapes to be about Elizabeth, like me, then he also manipulated his daughter to lie about her mother in court in order to gain custody of the child, resulting in his own wife's unaliving. However, Afton's manipulation and control over the series isn't just limited to humans. 
He also has control over the animatronics. I know, that sounds insane how a human has psychological control over robots. But let me explain. Or rather, someone who's more knowledgeable on the books. Yo, my Tani, can you help me out here a little bit? Thanks for having me here. One of William's goals throughout the Charlie trilogy and even the films is his desire for control over the animatronics. Our first showcasing of that is in The Silver Eyes, where William is confronted with his murders and told that he won't be able to hurt anyone anymore, to which he responds with, I don't have to, before explaining that the animatronics kill instead. It's almost as if they kill people for him, although this wasn't made clear until years later in the film where we are explicitly told that William influences the kids to kill and even bullies them when he loses control. Look at you! Look at the nasty things that you have become! Look how small you are! How worthless you are! You are wretched, what little beast! I made you! Because of the drawing of the five kids with the yellow rabbit, this was how he controlled them to kill people in the first place. They forgot the yellow rabbit killed them, and thus they still trusted him. We know we can use these other sources of media to explain why the animatronics kill people in the games, because the trilogy and films are still considered canon, despite being in another continuity. The guidebook informs us that we should know how Henry and William view the animatronics, how their views of the animatronics evolve over time, and see how they affect the story of the games. This tells us the animatronics in FNAF 1 attack people because of William's influence as the Yellow Rabbit. This also logically explains why the toys attack people as well. Just like the classics, William controls the toys to attack people with the pretense of defending their home. The animatronics in the rest of the books are simpler to explain. William explains the Twisteds are linked together to a system designed to control the choreography of the shows, and as Springtrap now controls the system to the choreography and thus uses them to kill people. He also uses the nightmares to torment kids in his experiment rooms, as Dittophobia tells us. We also know William, as Springtrap, created the Phantoms, since as soon as he shows up to Fazbear Frights, the Fright Guard in FNAF 3 experiences phantoms of both his past and of the building itself, which aligns with what we'd see in What We Found, a Fazbear Fright story where Hudson experiences horrific visions of his past and of the building itself after Springtrap shows up to the building. These are phantoms created by Springtrap to torment anyone who gets in his way. And lastly, the fourth closet not only tells us that William controls the fun times the same way he controlled the classics through a drawing of the missing children with the yellow rabbit, but he explains what he desires when he controls the animatronics as something, monsters, that he can mostly control that have unlimited potential. He uses the fun times with the purpose of capturing and killing kids. William doesn't just control the animatronics, he manipulates their psyche. In the films, he manipulated and scared Vanessa into submission to do his dirty work. He also manipulates Garrett as the film novel showcases him leading Mike to the Yellow Rabbit, and William is shown to still have contact with him in some interpretations of FNAF World. He also uses Elizabeth as baby to do his bidding in FNAF 6 and the Fourth Closet, and uses Mike to go to Sist location and possibly FNAF 1. All of this showcases William's quest for control, and is depicted as having control over mostly everyone around him, the animatronics, the people he uses to do his bidding, and the lives of those that fall before him. As Springtrap has previously said, Suffer now like all who have stood before me. Speaking of one of the people William controlled, let's take a look at Vanessa. What's her true connection to William, if any, at all? Well, I'd like to hand the mic over to Shadow Libra. Ever since we were introduced to Vanessa in Security Breach, one question always bothered me, and that was why she was important enough to be focused on in the story. My initial thought process was that she was just going to be the story's new villain until I read the books and realized the mimic was being set up instead. 
So why was she there? Who is she? It wasn't until the tapes that hinted at who she was. What we know about her is that she is who we play as in Help Wanted, and that she was being controlled by Glitchtrap, who we know is the Mimic, to become Vanny. We also know from the tapes that she has a father named Bill who manipulated her to badmouth her mom in court, to make her look bad and win the custody case over her. This is interesting because we already know of a father that shares these traits and name, William Afton. So naturally, I have my suspicions. The AR email suggests Vanessa's real name starts with an A, which ultimately means her father's last name also starts with an A paired with the security breach tapes, and it becomes extremely coincidental. But it wasn't until the movie that ultimately hammered the nail in the coffin. The FNAF movie is questionably canon, and obviously not gameline, but we can treat it like the trilogy and use basic elements that don't change across timelines, like characteristics of a character. In the movie, Vanessa was manipulated by her father, who we later learn is William Afton, to keep Mike in the dark about the truth and kill him if he got too close. Eventually, she overcomes this and helps Mike, and stands up against William. So interestingly, both Vanessas are manipulated by their evil fathers, whose names are both William A. So that raises the question, if Vanessa is William's daughter, when was she born? We don't see her at all in FNAF 4, nor sister location when Elizabeth came into the story of the games, and using that, people just assume she was Elizabeth reborn or something, which obviously doesn't make sense in the long run since Vanessa is very much different, with many different characteristics than Elizabeth. Vanessa's email implies she was born in 1997 and 23 in AR. That places the year in 2020, which is exactly when the emails in AR are said to take place. Thank you, Libra. Now, this video is already long already, and we're almost, what are we at? Almost at 20 minutes? Okay, and we still haven't gotten to the FNAF world, Gregory, Vanny, or Glitchtrap part of the theory yet. So, since we're running out of time here, I figured, here, let's try and speed this up a little bit. I'll take it from here. I said at the beginning of this video that there was one line in Help Wanted 2 that caused me to make this theory in the first place. Well, it's about time now that I tell you what that line is to bring you up to speed. During the final Circus Baby boss fight, you are trapped in the sister location bunker in complete darkness where you face three challenges put on you by Baby, aka Elizabeth. Keep in mind these events that we experience are the memories of the Mimic, who is Glitchtrap. During the introduction sequence, there is one line that is said by Baby that set off a ton of alarms in my brain. I like it here. It's safe. Safe forever. This immediately got me thinking because in Sister Location, Circus Baby outright tells us that she has tried to escape the bunker several times, but they always put her back. I've been out before, but they always put me back. They always put us back inside. That clearly indicates to me that she doesn't like being trapped in a dark basement. So why all of a sudden would she be saying that she likes it there and that it is safe? Well, let's think of who Circus Baby is. Elizabeth is Afton's only daughter, and because of that reason, as well as William's manipulation, she is very fond of her father almost to an obsessive degree, to the point where she becomes his loyal disciple by the events of FNAF 6. Elizabeth even states in the trilogy that she wants to be the focus of her father's attention, the center of his world. If the pieces haven't fallen into place yet, William's manipulation has reached Elizabeth by this time to make her think that the sister location bunker is a safe sanctuary and that she has no reason to worry. This is the exact same thing that William does to Rory in Dittophobia when he starts to get a grasp on the situation and, guess what, tries to leave. Even the wording and language is exactly the same, with William telling Rory that he is in a safe and special place, where he is safe and secure. And just like Elizabeth, the gaslighting succeeds and Rory resumes the experience, believing he is, indeed, in a safe place. Those words immediately made me think of FNAF World. 
Now, you may be wondering what Dittophobia or Help Wanted 2 or anything has to do with FNAF World, right? Well, come with me real quick to the clock ending of FNAF World. Look at the dialogue that Glitchbear, who is the Fredbear plush, says to the player. It's the same dialogue that William says in FNAF 4, Dittophobia, and what Baby says in Help Wanted 2. At this point, it became completely clear. FNAF World was just a lie made by William to trap whoever in a fake happiest day or bad memories. Now it all made sense. FNAF World is about William creating bad memories to trap the missing children and the repercussions of that are them being trapped in the fun times. In the novel trilogy, William tried to insert himself in the happiest day of the five kids, but it was never his own. He didn't give them that happiest day, Michael Brooks did. So, when he's making the fun times, he's trapping them in bad memories of them during the MCI. William tries to steal that for himself, but he never could. That's why the pieces are in the Follow Me minigames, but the kids aren't free, because they're bad memories. In FNAF 3, those bad memories are turned into good ones. Remember those lines from the beginning of the game, with the eyes, who are the same as Glitchbear. This is a safe place, a sanctuary. The truth is, there is no safe place. You don't understand that. Yet another lie told by William in order for him to give the missing children their happiest day. But anyways, that's the end of the theory for today. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, watching, and thank you to everyone that helped out with this theory. Uh, you guys did a great job. This was fantastic good work everyone uh and thank you to everyone who tuned in to watch uh if you guys want any more theories like this then you know what to do um anyways that's all from me today uh i will see you guys in the next video and of course always have a good day nice and silky smooth Journal entry, 2. Subject, Nightmare Own. Nickname, Nightmare? Okay. I've never known what to do with you, have I? <sighs> Alright, let's start with what we have. Nightmare Own made its first appearance in the FNAF 4 Halloween DLC. Oh, wait. It says right here that said appearance is not canon. Okay. But Nightmare Balloon Boy is canon? Whatever. Next thing. It says here that its first actual canon appearance is in the event known as Ultimate Custom. Of course it's the fucking icon as well. Jesus Christ. Okay, hold on. How would anyone know that? Ultimate Custom Night is something only William Afton experienced. It's a nightmare. Eh, just meta knowledge I guess. Now this is where the fun begins. It says here that the creature known as Nightmare Own is from that old VR headset game, according to its merchandise. Wait, merchandise? So it's a video game character, right? Wait, but then how are there random plushies in the most obscure and not obvious locations as if they were watching someone? Well, that seems to be the least of my worries. I'm more concerned about these guys. Who designed these? If it was Vanny, then why did she build them like Nightmare Young? Well, I think I have an answer. By proxy, Eleanor, Nightmare Young, Shadow Freddy, Nightmare, and all those guys were pretty much extensions of the same evil chaotic force known as the Shadow. If that theory is true, then it's very likely that after being trapped in that nightmare by Jake, Eleanor, or the Shadow, took a different form, this time being Nightmare Young. This would be why the Nightmare Young staff bots have In Your Dreams written on them. Fanny is also in direct control of the Nightmare Young staff bots and she designed them like Nightmare Young. But why? They're still around in Help 1 and 2 as well, and so is Fanny. 
but how is Vanny still a thing if Princess Crest 3 was supposed to free Vanny? Not only that, but Vanny, who is Vanessa controlled by Glitchtrap, is now against Glitchtrap. There's something else at play here, and I will definitely be looking more into this going further into my notes. More research is still required.